Um, we are in this series right now that we're talking about fact-checking Jesus. And uh, this whole idea that uh, people will go online and they'll put all kinds of ridiculousness about Jesus. And, and if you go onto the internet, um, I know when that first hit the scene back in the day, it's like, oh, if it's on the internet, it's true. And then um, we started seeing all kinds of weird things. And not everything we see on the internet is true, right? So a couple weeks ago, we talked about disinformation. We talked about what's fact, what's not. And anymore, I'll just say, as your pastor, and I've said this before, like, Martha, seriously, I have the hardest time trusting anyone when they say, well, well you know, and they say it so with so much like passion, you're like, is that true? And so there's so many questions we have, and there's a lot of questions people have in regards to the Bible. And so we're going to be fact-checking Jesus. And uh, this week we're going to talk about and look into, did, did really Jesus, did he really say that he was the only way to God? Is Jesus really the only way to heaven? Is Jesus the only way to eternity? And I know a lot of people who, who are, aren't of our same belief system, and maybe you're here today, or maybe you're watching online, and you know, you're what we call a truth seeker. You're just trying to figure this whole God thing out, and you, you believe there's like a God, you're not sure where he lines up in your life, but you're still trying to figure it out. And by the way, Church on the Hill is a great place to figure that out. Church on the Hill, right? This is a safe place. We want you to come, ask your question. You won't offend us. Um, and if you come to our face and go, well, well, I don't believe in your God, we'll go, okay. Okay, but all I know is this. We could look back at them and say, this is what God's done in my life, right, Nan? This is what God has done in my life, and so let me share with you and how he's touched my life and changed my life and turned my life upside down in a good way. And maybe, just maybe, they'll, they'll hear about this God, but it can sound very arrogant to someone who doesn't believe what we believe or grew up in the faith system that we grew up in. Like, you have the only true answer, and so today we're going to talk about that. And so I entitled our message, and you have to forgive me. Online, you have to forgive me. Um, I'm a kid who's a product of the 80s and 90s, okay? So I was born in 73, and so as I came into the late 70s and in the 80s, um, late 70s, early 80s, there's this thing that hit the scene. Debbie, you're, you're in that age group too. This thing came about. It was called rap music, rap music. Now some of you, and I won't even say what some of you used to call rap music, you used to call it with a C, you'd put the rap, you see rap, and you would call it that. But, um, but a kid who grew up in a, a school in Rialto, um, California, that was predominantly African American, this white boy got indoctrinated into rap music. And so um, it, was, it was a part of the culture, it was part of my life, and so um, it, it just, it was. And so when it hit the scene, all the best rappers were African American. And then this one Latino guy got up, and he wasn't very good. He tried. He was not good. And, you know, we made fun of the Hispanic kids, like, oh, your guy stinks. Oh, he's horrible. But then this white rapper came onto the scene. His name was Vanilla Ice. <laughs> and I know some of our senior saints are like, Vanilla Ice Cream? No, Vanilla Ice. That was his rapper name. That was his rapper name. And he came onto the scene, he had this big old hairdo, and the song that he was singing, it sounded pretty, it sounded good, like had this, this beat, well he stole it from uh, this rock group, but it was this cool beat, you know, and you're like, okay, I like it, and, but after a week, it, Danny, it got played out. And so all my black friends were like, ah, oh, see, you Hispanic kids, there's no good, you know, uh, Hispanic rappers, all oh, you white kids, there's no good white rappers, and we're like, you right, you right, that's how we talked, and then, you're right, we'd say, you right, you right. You're right, Eric, right? You're right. Nothing I can say. But then, uh, one of our African-American congregants said, you right. But then, but then, this little white rapper out of Detroit showed up. Angry little white boy. His name was Eminem. Some were like, you're not allowed to say that word in church. Oh, yes, I am. Yes, I am. He came on the scene. And he started saying stuff that made some of the black artists go, what is he, can he say that? And he hit the scene and he just took over. He took over. And next thing you know, all these little white rappers started popping up and they were all still horrible. But white people had this one guy, <laughs> this one guy, right? And so um, it was kind of fun for my African-American friends to go, oh, we'll give you that one, Jay. We'll give you that one. I'm like, he is what he is. 
And, but he had a song that came out years ago, and it was called, his, uh, his alternate name from Eminem was called what, Slim Shady. Slim Shady, for those of you guys that knew that music. And so he had a song because everyone was trying to act like him, sing like him, rap like him, be him. You can't be him. Um, and depending on how you feel about him, um, I still pray for him, by the way. If he came to know the Lord, how awesome would that be? That'd be awesome. be awesome. And from my, my understanding, he doesn't know the Lord yet. I'm going to say yet because I keep praying for him. But um, Eminem, if you're watching, praying for you, dog. Okay. <laughs> All right, all right. So um, anyhow, so he, he comes on the scene. Everyone's trying to be what we call a poser rapper. All these little white boys are trying to, to rap and be something, and they're just, they're not. They're not. And by the way, if you're at our church and you get offended by me talking about race so fluently, sorry, that's how I, I was raised. I mean, when you're a white kid who grows up in a predominantly African-American junior high, middle school, and then you go off to a, a high school that's mostly Hispanic, I, I just, this race is nothing to me. It really is nothing to me. Um, it's just when I'm out in the sun, I get red, you get darker. Okay, all right. So <laughs> anyhow, so here, here's this guy, he rises up, and he had a song that he was trying to tell everyone, will the real Slim Shady please stand up? Would the real guy come and show who he is? And so he had the song, it, Jason, do you remember this? It was a big song. It was really big. And back in the day, there used to be a TV station called um, MTV, which was music television. And it's long gone. It's not what it used to be. I mean, I think it's still MTV, but they used to show videos on that all day long. And now, I don't even know what that is. I don't even, they don't even show music because you can go to YouTube now and watch all the videos you want. But back in the day, you had to watch this to see your favorite artist and your favorite music video. Well, they had their MTV Music Awards, and it was bigger than anything else. And sure enough, this amphitheater's packed out. And all of a sudden, that song, Will the Real Slim Shady Please Stand Up, starts playing. And he comes marching in through the back doors of this big place. And as he's walking in, there's hundreds of little white boys with the same haircut. And he had super dyed blonde hair back then. And he was wearing um, just a white T-shirt and then jeans and white kicks. And by the way, I'm wearing some new white kicks just for that reason. But um, anyhow... He, they come in, and there's just hundreds of them, and they're just lining up, and everyone's like, what is going on? But his point is, there's only one me. There's only one me. And so today, we're going to say, will the real Jesus please stand up? Because there has been a lot of what we call posers that have come along, people who said that, that they were the Messiah. But did Jesus really say he was the one, or is there many ways to get to heaven. Um, I think that was a pretty good setup. I'm not going to lie. That was a good setup. I'm, should we pray? Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, God, we love you. Like that last song just said, there, there's no one like you. God, I, I, I pray that if there's anyone that's tuning online that doesn't know you yet or is worshiping with us this morning, hasn't put their full faith and trust in you yet, that God, that they'd see and understand that you are the only way. That, God, that they would know today that they could be made right with you. So, God, I just pray, God, for those of us that, that have known you for years, maybe this is going to be a, uh, a reminder to us as believers of what you said in your scriptures about being the way. God, I pray for those of us that, um, man, still, like I said, Lord, don't know you yet, that we would hear from your spirit. And maybe today will be that day that we put our faith in the way. And that we would understand that you're the love of our soul. So God, whoever we are, wherever we stand with you, I pray that you would speak to us, Holy Spirit. Speak through your word. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to be all over scripture today. I want to jump in first into Matthew 16. So if you have your bulletins, it's um, there in your bulletin. We'll have it up on the screen online. We'll have it up there for you as well. We're going to jump into Matthew 16, 13 through 14. And I want to uh, point a couple things out. Uh, Jesus comes in to this region called Caesarea Philippi, and he asks his disciples this question. So he's rolling with his guys. This is, this is his squad. This is his team. This is his guys he's hanging out with. And they're cruising along, and um, he has this question that he asks his guys. Here's the question. He says, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do the people say? say the Son of Man is. What's the poll? What are they saying? What's culture saying about me? 
Did you know that our culture here in America, and um, by the way, um, I, I, I heard, I don't know if this is true, Harvey, I guess someone from Canada was tuning in. I don't know. Canada? I don't know if that's true or not. If you're from Canada, hello. Um, but here in America, we have opinions. Did you know that as Americans we have opinions? Well, people have opinions of Jesus. And so Jesus is asking the question here to his disciples, what, what's the opinion that culture and people are having of me? And then their answer here in 14 says this. They replied, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah and still others, Jeremiah, or maybe one of the prophets. Like, you're somebody. You are somebody. We're just not sure what somebody you are. And see, culture is wondering about this Jesus. If you actually Google search this, and, and again, if you have a weak stomach, Hannah Viveros, don't do this. You're such a sweetheart. Don't do this, okay? And as soon as I say don't do this to Hannah Viveros, everyone knows she's going to go do this. But if you Google search, what do people think about church? Or what do people think about the Christian church? Get ready for some hate mail, Thousands, thousands, okay, probably millions of pages of answers of people what, how they can't stand God's church. But if you type in, what do people think about Jesus? Casey, it's crazy. It's different. What's the disconnect there? What's the disconnect? How is it that they hate the church but like Jesus? Uh, there was a poll that was done. Um, one of the favorite pollsters I love to follow as a Christ follower is called the Barner Group. And the Barner Group's been around for years and years and years and years, and, um, and they're just super, super solid. Actually, uh, secular publications will use this, Christian's, uh, this Christian research uh, group all the time to, to spout out different uh, uh, facts and information. They're really solid in regards to their polling. And so they did this poll... And they were asking this question to Americans. What do Americans believe about Jesus? And who do they say he is? And it says that 92%, so the vast majority of Americans, believes Jesus was a real person. The historical Jesus actually did live. There was a guy named Jesus. They believe that. They believe that. So when we talk about Jesus, most people believe that there, yeah, yeah, there was a historical Jesus. Absolutely, there was. And then as it, it dug deeper into the research a little bit, it says that the younger generation um, are increasingly less likely to believe that Jesus was God. So the, there's people out there that believe that Jesus was a real person, but the percentage of people that believe that Jesus was God is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It says here in the statistics, it says most adults, so about 56%, believe Jesus was God. 56%. 56%. While about one quarter of that, um, actually believe that uh, um, he's just another spiritual leader like, uh, like Muhammad or maybe the Buddha. Um, another one also says this, I think the remaining um, one-sixth, so 16, uh, 18% basically said, they weren't sure if Jesus was divine or not, like if he was God or not. So they believed that he was a man, he believed he was a historical figure, he's a good guy, came along, we could learn some stuff from a good guy, but um, he's not God. And so there was this Newsweek article. I know some of us aren't fans of Newsweek. That's okay. It doesn't matter. But they had this little thing in there. They actually had quoted a poll from a group I really admire. Um, there's a group by the name of Ligonier Ministries. And if you don't know that ministry, it's phenomenal. Um, one of my heroes in the faith, um, a great theologian who's gone on to be with the Lord, R.C. Sproul, helped found that from my understanding. And uh, here was a poll that they did in 2020. This news article quoted this, this group. It says, 52% of Americans say Jesus isn't God, but was a great teacher. Was a great teacher. So as we go after fact-checking Jesus, as we look into this a little bit going, okay, will the real Jesus please stand up? And by the way, every time I say that, do you hear the Slim Shady song? For those of you who grew up in that, I do too. So if I just start bobbing, just know. It's in my head. I, I, I can't. I just, that's, that's me. Ladies, you too, you were into that, right? Do you like that song? No, maybe not. We'll talk later. You're a sinner like me. I know you liked it. Okay. All right. So as we dive into this, Jesus is asking the question, so what are, what's culture saying? What are people saying about me, who I am? Let's look at Matthew 16, 15 through 16 now. 
It says this. Jesus now looks at his guys and he says, what about you? What about you? I know in the craziness of life sometimes with the ups and downs of, of life, and I know that some of you guys have been praying for our family of, of losing uh, my father-in-law, my, my wife's precious uh, uh, um, daddy, and my precious mother-in-law's husband. And, you know, it's, it's life's ups and downs, right? It's this ups and downs. And people can question when they're going through a tough time, is God really God? Is he in control? And so Jesus is asking his guys, okay, I know what culture, you've told me what culture is kind of talking about, but, but who do you say? I mean, you've seen me, you believe in me, and I know even us in the church, and some of us have been following God for 40, 50, 60 years, some of us, or more, have had those dark nights of the souls going, is God really God? Does he really care? Does he really care? And so he asks his guys, he goes, okay, so what about you there in verse 15? He says, who do you say that I am? Who do you say I am? Who do you say that I am? You know, as we go about living our lives and things hit people's lives and they turn to us, they're going to ask. James, they're going to ask. Who who is Jesus to you? What is going to be our our, our answer? So he, he turns here and he asks his guys this question. And can you imagine, I don't know if you've ever been in class and you think you know the answer. Have you ever been there? Like when you were younger, like you're sitting in class and the teacher asks a question. You're like, ooh, 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 I know the answer. But then right before you raise up your hand, you're like, ooh, but what if I'm wrong? You're, anyone? Everyone ever done that? Yes. Oh, gosh, it's so frustrating, right? So here are the disciples. Jesus turns to them and says, okay, I've heard who culture says I am from you. Now, who do you say that I am? And you know, they're all probably sitting around like, oh, who's going to say, who's going who's gonna to raise their hand? And we were always so thankful, right, when the teacher asked the question. Becca, you know, you see this as teacher, right? You ask the question, everyone's kind of looking around, and there's that one kid who always raises their hand. Like, they're super annoying, right? But aren't we glad they raised their hand? There's part of us going, okay, someone else can look like the fool, right? But here is one of the greatest fools in the Bible. I love him because I think... Um, uh, but basically, my sinful side is a lot like this guy. This is the precious, wonderful Simon Peter, God's right-hand guy in this time. And Simon Peter answers. He steps up and he says this. Okay, you're asking us? You're asking? I'll step forward. I'm the leader. I'll step up. I'll answer. This is what he says. He goes, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. The son of the living God. And if you study that scripture more, go more into it, and I don't have time to dive into it. I mean, Jesus goes on and on just how proud he is that he has that understanding because God himself gave it to him. It's beautiful, beautiful. But the question is, but what about you? What about me? What about us as his followers? What do we believe about him? Do we believe he is the Messiah? Now, a lot of people, if you're newer to church, uh, this word Messiah, we have a lot of Christianese words, and as you hang out and start studying the word of God, right, Ed, they'll learn some of the stuff that we say, and sometimes we have to, like, help you understand. So I'm going to help you understand, what does Messiah mean? Because it gets thrown around a lot in our culture. That person's the Messiah. Well, the Messiah is a word in the Hebrew that means anointed one, anointed one. And this is a title given to a person that is believed to be the Savior, who has been chosen to bring salvation to humankind. Um, It's this beautiful, beautiful picture um, that that Christians believe that that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that's going to save humanity. So what is he saying here? He goes, okay, culture's saying all this other stuff, like Jesus was a historical person, he was a good guy. But as Christians, who do we say is? He's the Messiah, the one that brings salvation to us all. That one person that when we put our faith and trust in him, he gives us eternal life. That means we never die. You're like, oh, pastor, that's wrong. That's wrong. We die. We die. People die. Not for Christ followers. We take our last breath here. Our next breath is an eternity with God. To grasp that, my little brain just goes, I have a hard time with it. But it's what God's word says. And those of us that put our faith and trust in him, right, Ramona? We know it's true. We know it's true. So we believe we have the one 
true Messiah. We believe as Christ was. We have the one true faith. We believe that. And I know, and if you're online and you're watching, you're going, Pastor, that's so arrogant. It sounds that way. It sounds that way. But I'm going to unpack for you in scriptures on how beautiful it is that God had one way, not multiple ways, so we're not confused. In Matthew 24, verse 5, it, it says this. Um, this is Jesus talking, okay? Remember, he asked his guys, who, who do people say I am? And in Matthew 24, 5, he says, this is what's going to happen. For many will come in my name. Many will come in my name. And they're going to say, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. And he will deceive many. Now, if you do any research in regards to people who have come along and said they're the Messiah, especially after Jesus showed up and then left, um, as deep as I could go, and I'm sure there's hundreds more, but there are some that history will actually point out that they came onto the scene and fooled many, many people. Um, I counted up to 30. I'm sure there's way, way more, way more. But in my time of being on this earth, um, a young spry 49, (laughs) um, uh, there was a guy who came onto the scene years ago out of the state of Texas who said he was the Messiah. Do any of you guys, I want to quiz them here in the worship center. Does anyone know of a guy that was in Waco, Texas? Do you remember the name of this guy? Someone say his name. David Koresh. David Koresh. Now, youngsters, if you don't know anything about this, Google search it. Crazy. This guy came on the scene loving God, preaching God's word, seeming like an awesome man of God. And then he went a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. He started to believe he was the Messiah. So he starts, James, he's preaching about himself. He starts coming up on the scene and going, I am the one who died for your sins. Oh. Oh, man, I, precious sister, what was it like when he finally faced the Messiah? And he goes, wait, you're not me. J- Jesus, I, I thought I was you. Wait, what's going on? Hey, hey. So many have come. Many people have come along and said, I'm the Messiah. And Jesus said, this is what's going to happen. So again, with the real Jesus, please, what, come on, church, say it. Please stand. Please stand up. Please stand up. Okay, all right, okay. So Jesus has come along and he goes, I want to make sure you understand, there's only, there's only one way. Um, years ago, I, I, I was a great youth pastor and I was a horrible youth pastor. Um, let me just tell you the horrible side, because that's what everyone likes to hear, right? Our failures, Pam, they love hearing our failures. Here's our failures. I don't know if it was failure, I thought it was pretty ingenious, but there were some kids not too happy with me after I did this. So um, uh, one time, I, I would print up the scriptures in our bulletin for our youth service and I would, you know, preach off of that, that verse, kind of like what I, I do here. And so anyhow, I'm preaching, and I decided that I would preach out of John 14.6, which is actually in your bulletins today. John 14.6. And if you don't have this memorized as a believer, this is a good one. This is a good one to take home and, and meditate on and pray over and, and know. And so, Casey, this is horrible of me. So I went ahead, and I changed, Ed, I changed up the verse I changed the verse. I took out, because in John 14, 6, we'll put it up on the screens for you. It says this. It says, Jesus answered, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And you know what I did? I switched it. I put down there, I put down there, I am a way, a truth, a life, and there's many ways to come to the Father. And I preached it. Like, Debbie, like it was the truth. I've just preached it. And by the way, I was very smart in this aspect. I told my youth leaders I was going to do that because I know some of my youth leaders, they would told, it's like, come up on stage and like grab the mic from me and like put me on the ground. Um, if you knew some of my youth leaders, they could do that. They're like jiu-jitsu specialists, right? But um, I told them I was going to do that. And so I'm preaching that. And you know what happened? Many of the kids, even the church kids who grew up in church and heard our lead pastor teach and sat under my ministry and our children's ministry and got taught by great people learning all the different verses. I'm preaching it, Haley, and they looked at me as I'm saying those very words. They were doing this. I am a way, a truth, a life. There's many ways to God. And they nodded. Now there were some kids looking at me like, This fool has lost his mind. I was so happy for those kids. They mad-dogging me. I love when the kids are like, 
man, something's wrong with him. That's not right. That's not right. But Jesus wanted you to understand something here in this scripture here. So let's look back at John 14, 6. When Jesus answered them, he says, I am the way. This is the way. I'm not going to make multiple ways. I'm not going to confuse you. I want you to understand there is one way. And the truth, okay? Um, Out on the streets when uh, I was growing up, if someone said, oh, man, that guy's the truth, that meant that, that, like, he was something. So if he was a basketball player, oh, man, right? They'd say, oh, man, that guy's the truth, right? He was a baller. He was a real baller. I mean, he was someone who really knew how to play basketball. And he's saying, and he's the life. And and this is very interesting. Again, I know it sounds so, so what's the right word, disrespectful when Jesus says here, no one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other way. There's no other way. Now, I've shared in the past that um, I've done this a few times in my life, and I know some of you have done the same thing. You're in a new city, and you're driving along, and there's one-way streets, and you're not paying attention. Uh, too many times in San Diego, I can tell you, there's times we went to a, a Padres game and I'm, the whole family's driving along and the family's following me. Mom, do you remember this? And the whole family's following Tammy and I in our car and I'm just like, no, 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 and I'm like going down wrong streets. One way, wrong way. Jesus wants to make sure you understand in his word there's, there's, one, there's one way. There's one way. Oh my gosh, the morning is fleeting. Let me jump to the next, the next scripture. I'm gonna have to pound through this one because I wanna make sure I get to the end here. Um, I want to point something out to you um, here in Acts 5, 34 through 42. I want to read it to you real quick. I can't unpack all of this for you, but I just want to read it to you. It's not in your notes. It'll be up on your screen. There's a lot to read. It says this in Acts 5, 34 through 42. So the disciples, Jesus is, is come back from the dead. Do, 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 do. Amazing. They once were scattered and running all over the place, afraid of their life. Now they've seen him alive again. Now they're just being bold. They're preaching the gospel everywhere. The religious leaders of that time are having a fit. So they bring them in and want to try them. And so they're trying to decide, are we going to try to kill them? What are we going to do? We've got to get these guys off the scene because they're preaching stuff we don't believe. And so they're having this big discussion. Here's where we pick it up in Acts 5.34. It says, but a Pharisee named Gamaliel a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people. And if you hear last week, I mentioned him a little bit. He stood up before the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Of teenagers, have you ever been gotten in trouble with mom and dad? And they're going to decide your punishment? And they go, leave the room. Yes, because they need to decide your doom, right? And they need to figure that out with you not in the presence. That's what's happening here. So they send the disciples out. And this teacher of the law that people honored, they respected. He was an amazing, amazing teacher. One of the premier teachers of the law at that time. He stands before, in verse 35 it says this. He addresses the Sanhedrin. This would be, imagine like someone stand before Congress. He says, men of Israel, consider carefully. Um, For those of you that follow politics, wouldn't it be refreshing if some of our elected officials like, like stepped out carefully before they make decisions? Man, goodness gracious. It says, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. Look at verse 36. Some time ago, uh, Thaddeus appeared claiming to be somebody, somebody, and about 400 men rallied around him. And it says he was killed and all of his followers dispensed and it all came to nothing. They ran for their lives. When Jesus was first crucified, when he was taken into prison and then crucified, where were the disciples? Running like little scared girls. Running just for their lives. They could be scared boys too. Okay, I'll be be fair. (laughs) Disappeared, right? Verse 37 says, After him, this guy named Judas from um, a Galilee appeared in the days of the census, and he led a band of people into revolt. And look what they did to this poor guy. So he starts this revolt. And it goes on to say that he too was killed and all of his followers scattered. They, they just left. They got scared. That's how they used to say it when I, where I grew up, scared means scared. Okay? They scattered. Verse 38. Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. And I love this. I'm going to reteach this someday. I'm going to reteach this. This is so good. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin... 
it will fail. It will fail. If this is a poser Messiah, will the please, will the real Jesus please stand up? If it's not the real Jesus, if this is the real Slim Shady, if this is the real guy, don't worry about it. It's just going to go away. It's going to go away. Now watch what this next verse says. Oh my goodness, this is so great. In verse 39, this premier teacher of the law says, but if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. This is awesome. Yeah, you can clap, sister. Thank you for that. They, yeah, praise be to God for that. That is like when you have that dream. And men, I think it's mostly men. I only know this because I'm a man. When we have those dreams and someone's coming after our family and we have to defend our family and we have to fight, isn't it like horrible even if you know how to fight? Like in your dream, you feel like you're like, like they're punching you normally and you're like, I can't punch. Has anyone ever done that? Like you can't defend your family. You can't fight in your dreams. That's what he's saying here. If this is a man, that it's done. They're on, it's over. But if this is of God, you might as well just, you can't fight against it. You can't. Will the real Jesus please stand up? Because if he is really Jesus, then guys, if we try to battle this, it's over for us. And it was. And it was. Let's go on and read. Verse 4, it says, in his, his speech, there in verse 4, he says, his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles and, and still have them flogged, still have them beat to a pulp. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name like, mm -mm -mm, you better stop it. Like we just whooped you up. You do not use that name again. And then it goes on to say, if you ever study this, it's dudes, I think we love this, this verse, right? This is like a man's man's verse right here. It goes on to say, um, so after they were flogged and ordered not to speak in the name, verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering the disgrace of the name of Jesus. That means they left out of there bloodied and bruised and just like, oh, that, that, that was horrible. <laughs> Spitting up blood. Man, look, you see my back is all beaten up. Oh, my gosh. Almost looks like Jason. You know, just hurting, right? That's an inside joke I'll tell you another time. Beaten up. And they're rejoicing. Why? Because the real Jesus stood up. Christ followers that are in the room. Christ followers are watching online. This is how we know that we know that we know. So when this world's going, I don't know. There's so many philosophies. There's so many things. Where do we land? As Christ follows, we go, we have the answer. We have the answer. And so it says in verse 42, that day after day in the temples and the courts and the houses to houses, they never stopped teaching. They never stopped proclaiming, Ryan. Never. That Jesus is the Messiah. Oh, so good. Man, church, I could keep you here for like two hours. I know, I got to hustle. I want pastors say that. You're like, oh, please don't. Okay, here we go. Acts 4.12. Acts 4.12, I want to show you this one. Acts 4.12 says this. This is after the Lord is shown back up on the scene. He's now gone to heaven. His disciples are out preaching, and they're seeing God do miraculous things. It is said this in uh, Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else. Salvation is found in, in no one else. For there's no other name. That's why when you hear Christians sing in the name of Jesus, when we hear the name of Jesus, oh, it's sweet. There's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And I know this world says, that's so arrogant of you Christians. So arrogant. As you can tell as your pastor, I love polls. I love statistics. I love hearing what, what are people thinking, what are they saying. Um, there was another poll that said this, that many people today believe that all religions are true, according to the recent Barna study, it says that 58% of teenagers and 62% of adults agree with this statement, that many religions can, be, can lead to eternal life. Just like my youth that were standing there and, and, and nodding their heads. And that there is no one true religion. There's not one. And as we sit there and look at it, and I, I want you to write this down. If you're a note taker, 
um, or if you're a person who likes to put your notes into your phone. By the way, we have an app where you can follow along and type it in, but this would be a good one to put in. So I'm totally okay with you grabbing your phone right now and putting this like, in the memo, or you can write it down online. You can just write this down. But here's a statement I want to give you. All religions can be wrong. All religions can be wrong. But all religions can't be right. All religions can't be right. Let me say it again. All religions can be wrong. But all religions can't be right. They can't be. They can't be. Um, I want to do a little quick illustration to, to just point out this. I, I used to do this at camp, summer camps all the time. This is really great. In regards to truth, Pastor Mark, this is a great one. So um, if you were going to um, point at me, so everyone go ahead and take out your hand that you would point, you'd point and just go ahead and just point, point at me. Go ahead and point at me upstairs. I'm going to see, balcony, I'm going to see. Just, yeah, take your pointing finger, like, like point at me, like, like you're mad at me. And if you're really mad at me, just, okay, easy. I saw, someone was like, mm -hmm, you've been practicing in the mirror. Like, you've been wanting to do that to me for years. I've only been here a year. What, how's that possible? But anyhow, so point to me. So er, everyone, 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 Lucas, do I see your feet here? Yes, yep, that's the one. Okay, right? Here's what I need you to do. Just trust me. Just trust me. Okay, so take your pointing finger. Now close your eyes. Hold on to your pointing finger. Keep it up. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now with your eyes closed and your pointing finger up, point south towards San Diego. Point south towards San Diego. Point south. Don't cheat. Don't look. Point south towards San Diego. Okay, all of our friends that are uh, watching online, I'll tell you what's happening next. Okay, open up your eyes and keep pointing. Keep pointing. Keep pointing. Open your eyes. Now look around to where everyone's pointing. Uh, the Ubes, your family's jacked up. You guys are going in different directions. Wait, wait. Debbie, why'd you put your finger down? I'm trying to see where everyone's. Debbie, where were you pointing? Debbie, back at yourself? Yourself? You're going to go south. Yes, okay. Let's see. So, oh, some of you are right. Some of you are right. Wait, Nan, I didn't see where, where, where was your cell, where's your cell, where, oh, there, were, that way, okay, here we go, south, okay. Have you noticed something? Okay, you can put your hands down. You guys couldn't agree which way south was. You couldn't decide which way south was. I remember being at one conference, and these two people were pointing at each other. <laughs> couldn't decide. So today, how do we decide? Back in the day, we used to have a compass, right? We'd have a compass, we'd get that out, and we could tell which way, and I'm going to assume. Would someone get out their smartphone and tell me which way is south, just for sure, for sure? You got that for me? Figure that out. I, th I, think, I think we were right. Pam, I think we were, I think you and I were right. It's that way. I think it's that way. It's that way, I think. Pretty sure. We'll see. Wait, Frank is saying that way. Wait. Stop, stop it. Okay, we'll figure it out here in a minute. So we have smartphones that can kind of help us, right? But as Christians, how do we find out what's true? God's word. God's word. Did we figure out which way south was? No. no? I got, I'm, I'm getting, well, Frank's saying that way. Okay, we'll figure that out later. We're going to have a church meeting afterwards to decide which way south. And noting church folk, we'll still won't, like, land on what it is. It says here. No, that's not right. Okay. Right. Here we go. So, I want to talk about some of the world religions real quick. Because remember, I said, God bless you. I want to point out to you this. If, if all religions can't be right, all could be wrong. But what do all the different religions uh, believe? Now, I can't go through all the world religions, so I picked out five, if that's okay, five. And uh, we came in fifth because I can put fifth. It's not that we're... We're fifth on the list. It's just I put us on fifth. Here's number one. Here's one of them. So here's the religion. Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. So let's talk about these five. And what do they think about God? What is their, their belief? So Buddhism about God this is what they believe. No God. No God. There's no God. So the Buddha, that beautiful little guy that's at a lot of like Asian restaurants there. And by the way, I got in trouble once. Tam, do you remember that? We went into a place and there's this beautiful Buddha. And I, I touched the Buddha's belly. That was not a good move. They were not happy. Like, do not touch the Buddha's belly. I'm like, he's so cute. His belly's like so cute. But um, not a good thing. 
Like if I had a cross up there and someone put their hand on Jesus' belly, I've been not offended, but they were offended. Anyways, so Buddha believes there's no God. Hinduism believes what? Many gods. Many, many gods. This is like the Costco of religions. This has got stuff, right? Then there's Islam. Islam, they believe there's one God. His name is Allah. And then Judaism, they have one God, and we worship this God as well. His name's Yahweh. He's got one of the coolest names, God's name of Yahweh. And then Christianity, we would say we have the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what we have. Now, what do these religions say about salvation? That's very important, right? I mean, if there's an eternity, if there is a heaven, if there's an afterlife, what, what do these religions say about this? Well, Buddhism will say there's enlightenment. Like, you'll just get to a point where like, oh, you just got it figured out. Hinduism believes in reincarnation, reincarnation. Now, when I was a kid, I, I mean, I liked this one. I liked this one a lot. And it's very interesting to me. Have you ever met someone who believes in reincarnation? Like, when they have conversations with you, um, they'll always share with you, like, well, you know, in my past life, I was a king. Or they'll say, or I was a famous politician or an actor. Really? You never hear anyone say, I was an ant who got stepped on by some dude. Right? It's never, it's, oh, by the way, if you believe in reincarnation, we love you. We know you're still truth-seeking. I love you. Let's, let's talk about, well, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about that. Okay. Islam believes in the five pillars, so uh, uh, you've got to believe in these five pillars, and I'll have to teach on that sometime. So for their salvation, they have to believe and follow these five pillars, and, and prayer and devotion to God is part of that. Fasting is part of that. Um, Judaism believes in the law, the Ten Commandments. You know, believes there's one God, honor him, and then you've got to follow these, these rules. And then Christianity believes in grace. That believes that anyone can come to the saving grace of knowing God and can be forgiven of their sins. And it's not about what you do for God. It's what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. Okay? And it's easy for us to say, yeah, amen, pastor, because that's what we believe, right? But do you understand how a world can look at this Costco-filled uh, life of all these religions going, which is it? And then in regards to um, other religions, Buddhism believes, no, there's only one religion. All the other religions are, are false. So we're not the only one. Um, Hinduism believes like, yeah, everyone's in. Game on. Everyone come play. Yep, it's all good. All's true. Islam believes, nope, no, 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 no. Uh, all religions are false. Judaism, false. Everything else is false. Christianity, we believe we have the way, the truth, the life, okay? So as we look at all this stuff, as I'm saying, they all can't be true, but they all can be false. Now, I believe there is one true God, and I know it's hard for some of us to be able to say that, and I know if you're a truth seeker and you're trying to figure out this God thing, I know it can sound so arrogant but we believe that God's word is true. We believe in testimonies of the people that saw Jesus raised from that. We believe in that. And he's transformed our lives, which a testimony is more powerful than, than anything. But though there's a story, and I, I couldn't show you the video. So if you go onto Google sometime, this is one I want you to go look up. So um, if you're taking notes and you want to go see this video, it, Ryan, this will blow you away. It's a great thing. There's a video... Um, that uh, a famous guy uh, shot probably about 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, his name is Penn. His name uh, is famous from, he's in that show in Las Vegas called Penn and Teller. Have you heard of Penn and Teller? I think they're, they're magicians, but also ventriloquists plus comedians plus, they do it all. They have this big show in Vegas, right? Well, Penn's the big guy. He's huge. He's like 6'6", six, six, big, big guy. And so if you go on and you type in Penn and Teller, um, into YouTube, and you put in there um, a gift of a Bible. So write that down, a gift of a Bible. You'll see this video. It's like 10 minutes long or so. And anyways, Penn's home from a show, and it looks like he's like, I don't know, on FaceTime or something, and he's recording himself on like a, like a video, like a, a vlog, and he's talking um, to, him, to, to the camera, and he says, hey, um, after one of my shows, or before one of my shows, uh, I ran into this guy who was a fan, who was a Christian. And as we're talking, uh, he's sharing his faith. Now, you've got to understand, Penn is a staunch atheist. When I say staunch atheist, he'll just tell you, no, it, what you believe is just false. And this staunch 
atheist is being talked to by this Christian and they're talking and the Christians didn't go up to him and go, you use foul language in your show. Didn't say that at all. Actually, it was very complimentary to him and said, man, what, what a great show and, and what have you. And he grabbed a Gideon's Bible. If you don't know what that is, it's a little small Bible that the Gideon Association would hand out. And it has, um, most of them have like a, um, uh, at least the Psalms in it and then the New Testament and they'll, they'll give them out. And this guy said, listen, I want you to have this. And he told the guy, he goes, I, just so you know, I, I am proselytizing. And I, remember, that's a, a big word that I didn't even understand years ago. But it basically means that we are wanting to tell you about our truth. Like, we know you believe something different, but we want to tell you what we believe. And so he gives this him. And here's this staunch atheist just getting this from this Christian man. But he was so kind and so sweet and so caring as he's talking to Penn about this. And I'm going to quote Penn on here. And you got to watch the video. I wish I could have showed it. It was so beautiful. Um, but it, he, he said this. Penn says, if you believe there is a heaven, so he's talking after this interaction with this Christian. So he's saying this to the camera. He says, if you believe there is a heaven and a hell, and that people could be going to hell or not get into eternal life. So he's, he's talking strongly, especially it sounds like to Christians. He said this, and this just, oh, just inside of me. If you're a Christ follower, this is just inside of you. He says, how much do you have to hate someone not to proselytize? Here's an atheist saying, this guy cared so much and knew that I'm a staunch atheist and I don't believe anything he does. And, I, and this guy could probably destroy this guy with his thoughts and beliefs. He's a very educated man and say he could destroy this Christian. But he's saying, how much do you have to hate? And I know we go, well, I don't want to offend anyone. Don't we say that a lot? I don't want to offend anyone. You know, we don't talk about politics. We don't talk about church. Well, we need to talk about church. Because if, this God that we believe in is the one way, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Then we have the golden ticket, and we don't share that. He says this. How much do you have to hate someone? An atheist said that. I'm telling you, I'm preaching, sister. He said this. He goes, if I believed a truck was going to hit you, and you don't believe me. So he's saying, if I'm looking at you as an atheist, and I believe there's a truck coming, it's going to hit you, and it's barreling down on you. And I go, there's a truck that's about to hit you. And you go, I don't believe there's a truck. I don't see no truck. There is no truck. And as it barrels down to you, he said this, and I'm quoting him. He goes, as it barrels down on you, there will be a certain point, as it's getting closer, there will be a certain point where I will tackle you. He's 6'6". Six, six. He's a big man. He says, so at a certain point, I'm going to tackle you. And this is what he said. Oh, Christians, he said this next. When I heard him say this, I'm like, how embarrassed am I to hear this as a Christian? Because sometimes I'm worried if I'm going to offend someone about this truth that I have at in Jesus. He said this, the atheist said this next. He says, this is more important than that. If this guy truly believes the gospel, if this guy truly believes what he believes in, if he truly believes, it's more important than me tackling that guy to get him out of the raid of that truck that was about to hit him, tackling them in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm not telling you, church, that we need to go out to lunch and we need to sit there and our waitress comes up. Pam, we never do this to any of your waitresses back in the day. But if we came up and said, oh, do you know about the Lord Jesus? And they say, we don't know about the Lord Jesus. You need to know him. Well, I don't believe in your God. We wouldn't go up and then tackle her. But you better tip her well. And as you tell her, man, I know you don't know this Lord yet, but I know this Lord, and I tell you what, you tip her well. And don't leave one of those tracks that has the $100 bill on it. That's just ludicrous. My mom was a waitress for years. We needed that money to pay rent. So don't go leave a little track and then $2. If you're going to leave a track, leave $100 along with that track. Do you see what I'm saying here? So will the real Jesus stand up? If we believe, Sarah, if we believe, baby... You know our family believes. We believe this to be true. Mom, right? We believe this to be true. Church on the Hill, we believe this to be true. Amen? Amen. 
then if that's the case, the real Jesus has stood up, and it is our job to tell this world. I'm going to have our worship team come up as I close. I feel such a burden as your pastor. But I'm going to shock you with a statement I'm about to say. It's going to shock some of you. My burden, my burden is not for you, the Christ follower. I didn't come to Riverside. My family didn't up end our family's life in San Bernardino to come to Riverside just because it's a nicer place to live. I didn't come to this historic church that was about dead to come just be a pastor to a bunch of saved people. I came because I believed that God called Tammy and I. I remember sitting out in this parking lot asking God, is this where you want us? Because God, I don't want to come. And I remember telling the search committee, I will not come. If I go to this church and I'm there a year and they're not about reaching people for the lost people for Jesus, I'm out. I'm a year in. I'm still here. You know why? Because I believe that you now believe and understand that it's more than just us. It's more than just music. It's just more than preaching styles. It's more. It's more. It's the saving grace of the Lord Jesus. Our job. Online, our job. The last verse I I had for you this morning after I listened to Penn, an atheist say what he said, came out just so strong from the Holy Spirit. Romans 1, 16. And some of you guys have memorized this over the years. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel Because it's the power of God that brings salvation. What's it say next, church? To what? Everyone. Church, say it with me. Everyone. Everyone. Who what? Believes. Believes. And it says first to the Jew. Yeah, that's who he came for first. He's like, yep, my chosen people. I'm there for them. But they're not all going to accept me. So I'm going to open this up to the Gentiles. That's the rest of us. That's why we love the unlovable. That's why when we get cut off, and if you're watching online, maybe you don't know about the hell that we live in here in Southern California off the 91 freeway. (laughs) And people wave to you, you're number one. But they're not using this finger. Or a kid goes riding their motorcycle down your street doing wheelies. To show them God's love, saying, yeah, that's not right, man, but do you know there's a God that loves you? God that cares about you? Let me tell you what he's done. This just reminded me. um, Larry, a.k.a. It's Lawrence. Larry? We go by Larry. Larry. I always go back and forth. Larry and I were talking, I don't know, so a week or so ago, and he's been following the Lord a long time, haven't you, my friend? A long time been following God. He mentioned how good God has been to him years and years and years and years, how faithful and wonderful and gracious God has been to him. If God has been gracious and loving to you, it's time for us to tell this world about him. And it has to be, it could be so subtle, it could be so small. It doesn't take a whole lot. As your pastor, I'd like to just, if we could bow our heads and close our eyes as we get ready to, to sing worship to this God we love so much. Would you pray with me? God, I know this is going to sound weird. But God, I, 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 I mentioned Eminem at the beginning of this, Lord. Um, he doesn't know you yet. That I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know if this rap artist, one of the greatest 
top selling artist of all time knows you, but I pray that he would come to the saving grace of knowing you. I don't know if there's any other pastors in the world praying for him right now, but this pastor is. God, I, I, I don't know about this, this pen of pen and teller, Lord. He, he, it sounds like back in the day he was such a staunch atheist, but Lord, he understood what we should understand as Christians. I, I pray that he comes to the saving grace of knowing you like now. I pray that he finds that Gideon Bible and starts reading it and that your spirit would speak to him. Then God, I just believe right now, I, I, I've sensed your presence in this room online. I, I hope you're sensing God's presence as you watch this, this, this video. But God's stern right now, and I believe there could be one, two, three, or many, many more that have not put their saving grace in God yet, but days that day. If you are listening to this sermon and you're sensing God's touching your heart right now, I pray right now that you will just open your heart to Jesus and would you just say, Jesus, I need you. Just between you and him, would you say, Jesus, I need you. And then we do something simple around here at Church on the Hill. We believe in the ABCs of salvation because salvation is as simple as that. Would you just say to Jesus right now, A, I admit I'm a sinner. I admit I'm a sinner. I sin against you, Jesus. And right now, I don't understand it all, but the B in this ABCs is believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I don't understand it all, but there's something that's happening inside of my heart and my mind that, that I understand now that this is the way, this is the truth, this is the life, that it only comes by you. I believe in you now, Jesus. I give you my life. And then C is this. God, now I choose to follow you with the rest of my life. God, I don't know what that exactly is going to mean, but I'm giving it to you and I want to learn from you. I want to learn from you. God, I pray for that person that just said that prayer, that they'd be bold enough to share with us that they said that prayer and that we would celebrate with them that, that they, they were once lost, but now they're found. They were once far from you, but now they're a child of God. Thank you for them, Lord. And then for those of us as believers, with all of our heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to pray, God, that you would help us to not forget about our first love and tell this world about our first love. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.